You are listening to the podcast of the Maciasz Korvinas Collegium, the largest talent management institute in Hungary. If you want to know more about our mission, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en or check out our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter channels. For interesting articles and analysis of our professors, external contributors, and students, look up our knowledge base at korvinac.hu slash en. So welcome everyone. My guest today is an academic from the Netherlands, currently based in Budapest, as a visiting fellow at the Matthias Corvinus Collegium. He's an expert in business diplomacy and international business, as has been a lecturer at several universities across Europe and the world, but he will tell more about his career. Today we'll talk about his newest research, newest research topic, the implementation of Catholic social teaching in international business. Very interesting. Hugh Brill, welcome to MCC Podcast. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Could you tell a bit more about yourself and this new research to our audience? Yeah, uh, thank you once again. Um, uh, about myself, yes, indeed, as you said, thank you for introducing me. I'm from the Netherlands and I taught at different universities and um, and I also was very much involved in, in just as a sideline in things like um, internationalization of higher education or trying to help universities of applied sciences in the Netherlands to integrate research in their curricula because that is one of the challenges what you see in, in the Netherlands. But... Besides that, I academically and research-wise, I focused uh, uh, the, over the past more than 10 years on the um, overlap or the interaction between and the intersection between international business and diplomacy, as you more or less already introduced. And, um, and that brought me um, to also at a certain point, so I did work on economic diplomacy, commercial diplomacy, not important now to explain exactly what the differences are, maybe later on. I did quite some stuff on particularly one type of instrument in international business, which is trade missions. <laughs> Although it seems like a non-significant kind of topic, but all countries around the world, including Hungary, uh, we're organizing trade missions to uh, neighboring or faraway countries to um, to um, to to promote our business and e- economy and to establish and and sustain uh, business relations. And as we speak, <laughs> this is fun for the podcast. There is a, 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 a about there is a trade mission being organized from the Netherlands to Hungary. Okay. So the uh, Dutch embassy here in Budapest is currently inviting uh, businesses in the Netherlands to join the trade mission to Budapest. Uh, to we are Hungary. recording this podcast in 2021 August. It, just for the exactly. for the future listeners. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so later on in a in a follow up we could even elaborate on how that worked out and all the implications of that. Uh, that that could be fun. But so my for example this one particular instrument on trade mission brought me uh, for example in the Netherlands all over the news because one of the things that I was investigating is, is do tra- trade missions work and how do they work especially how do they work. Um um, but also then after economic diplomacy, commercial diplomacy, I moved to business diplomacy. The role of um, multinationals, uh, multinational corporations and how they operate in the international arena. Sorry, let, let's stop here for a second because I think it's very important to, to clarify this term business diplomacy because you know, usually we tend to think that uh, business world is all about money and, you know, cultural awareness or this diplomatic approach or gestures have been respla- replaced a long time ago but by, by radically result-driven approaches or models, so to say. This question exactly also was one of the things that triggered me. I saw in, in, in a few academic um, journals or one particular academic journal, I saw somebody publishing and using the term business diplomacy management that was in an international management journal. And that triggered me like, okay, so somebody dares to mention the word business diplomacy management. Immediately, that's more than 10 years ago, I thought like, okay, business diplomacy, but isn't that something similar to lobbying or corporate political activity or you name it? Um, So I felt the need, like, I want to know more what it is, what this author, what this this colleague of mine meant with it. And we're in... (laughs) we're not friends, so to speak, but we're good colleagues. We, we often, quite often meet. 
Um, and that brought me to actually the conclusion that how it was used, business diplomacy, the concept was actually rather empty. Mm-hmm. Rather empty, meaning like, yes, actually what those, what this author and also the references that he used was um, uh, referring to was actually what I call lobbying. Very opportunistic business behavior. Yes, totally legal, nothing wrong in it, just to to serve the uh, purpose and, and, and uh, of the business. And I thought, then we don't need something new like business diplomacy. If we use it like this, then we have already all that's out there. So I started to say, okay, we need then to find whether there is something like a gap Uh, not only in the literature as such, as academics tend to think like, is there a gap in the literature, but also in practice. Is there something new about this, what I would call business diplomacy? And that, uh, indeed, I concluded, yes, there is this gap. Yes, there is something. And when I talk about business diplomacy, it is indeed the, the, in the simple terms, it's like businesses behaving like diplomats do, as one of my colleagues in the Netherlands in international relations puts, but that's the easy term. The more complex way is that businesses operate and act and present themselves in in the diplomatic arena. So they um, get in touch with uh, heads of state. Uh, they, um, they have such a leverage and such a um, size that they are also being welcomed by by heads of state like wow you're more like the president or the, of of some sort of a neighboring country and in that role they have power um, and that power or uh, should be used and that's where i what i call business diplomacy in a diplomatic way and diplomacy actually for me has two key things that is it's always diplomacy says I recognize the other as an equal partner. That's where diplomacy starts between countries, otherwise. Um, And I I respect that the other also has full rights, has legitimate reasons to be there. So I should respect the others. And if you apply that to business operations, to business diplomacy, that means that business diplomacy starts where businesses start to act like respecting the interest of others as full equals rather than in an opportunistic way. So that's where business diplomacy deviates from lobbying or political activity. And do you think that did we did we lose this approach in the past decades? Because for me, it, it sounds like a, sound, a kind of rediscovery of diplomatic gestures in the diplomatic world, in the commercial world. And, and obviously we have, especially in the Netherlands, You, you've got a very rich history of, of business diplomacy in this sense. So have we lost track in the, in the past decades or something has changed so that we need to rediscover this, the, such models or such behavior in the commercial world? Very irrelevant and interesting question. There, um, I think yes, I think yes, uh, because in today's world, what we've seen over the past call it 50 years, we've seen an, 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 an amazing growth in, in the number of multinational corporations. We live in a world where we have more multinationals than ever before. I think up to now we may have close to 100,000 really multinationals, and I'm not even counting the all the affiliations. For an, uh, um, and so the role of multinationals has become so huge that even multinationals themselves may not sometimes be aware of altogether the power of 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 of, uh, of them all together um, and that is something new i think and that makes it also very important for us academics and practitioners to realize this and what that means for business and for for how multinationals operate so yes in the past we saw also things that one could call business diplomacy which should not easily be confused with commercial diplomacy or economic diplomacy, but in today's world, um, call it over the past 50 years, we've seen an, this this phenomena of this uh, t- tremendous amount of, of big companies and their impact. And that's 
why I'm, I think like, oh, wow, we need to be careful and pay more attention to this phenomenon and how they operate. And uh, I didn't call it in, in my upcoming book something like neo-business diplomacy or new business diplomacy, which I could have perhaps, <laughs> but uh, that's now something, you know, that comes out of this uh, interesting conversation. Yeah, and let's, let's speak about the other component, namely the Catholic Church, which, which is surprisingly appears in this context, I mean, in a very, very positive sense. Uh, one can find more or less serious studies on why the Catholic Church is the first real global organization with lots of elements worth discovering and discussing when someone wants to learn organizational leadership and wants to learn more about global companies or the behavior, as you've just mentioned, of, of this newly emerging kind of multinational companies and organizations. Do you agree with this comparison? Let me say no, not exactly, because the Catholic Church was never uh, a business. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> organization. <laughs> organization. Stick to organization. Uh, but it, then it was still a... Okay, I, I, I have to be careful because we all know the, 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 the history of the Catholic Church uh, in its ups and its downs, but it was a non-profit organization. Let's assume that it was like this. Absolutely not for profit. That, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If we approach this like, like from this angle, yeah. Um, but um, then I would rather say uh, where, where the, the Catholic Church is... is Is, is, is more like a movement perhaps than, than of course there is an organizational basis uh, but then uh, it, is, it is a different thing than a business it's more like uh, and it doesn't it, it, it doesn't sell a product or even a service it, 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 it extends a message and try, that tries to inspire others um, with still one particular clear uh, leader, the Pope. Um, so therefore I do see a difference, but it is an interesting phenomenon as such that uh, an organization like the Catholic Church uh, has been among us, let's say about 2000 years. And how, how did you find Catholic social teaching and, and why did you consider it, you know, somehow comparing or, or trying to fit into the world of diplomacy or international diplomacy? I got really uh, fascinated by uh, what I call morality, by the morals, what's not without any judgment, not being judge, judgmental towards businesses or multinationals as such, but just morale. And um, I did not find in the, uh, what I call the mainstream academic literature, the theories that could help me to feed this business diplomacy research that I was doing with, uh, with something, uh, with, a, with a moral theory. Uh, yes, there is business ethics as a, as a field of study, Um, and um, mostly what you see in, in, in business and management literature, academic literature, is either it's, 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 it's uncontested that the purpose of business is to, to share the shareholder value maximization to serve that purpose, or when it is contested, then you see over the past 20, 30 years, stakeholder theory. So the idea, okay, no, there are, there are more the stakeholders than only shareholders. There are also, you've got civil society, you've got NGOs, you've got uh, workers. So we move to a more stakeholder-like thing. But for me, that was still not yet enough. I wanted more because stakeholder theory for me still basically is based on the same principles as the shareholder value maximization view. Namely, it's based on, on, on a view of... of Uh, the, the business being owned by, by financial shareholders only. Um, it's based on an individualistic approach of the organization uh, as an organization being a, a nexus of con contracts. So people have worked together because they have a contract together. And that's why I get money. So I do something for you. And because, uh, you know, it's like an exchange. And that, and, and, Um, and that really didn't, and, and also stakeholder theory does not say 
it, it, it acknowledges that there are more stakeholders than only shareholders. However, it doesn't, and it, yes, it tries to uh, say, yes, we need to serve the interests of all the stakeholders, but then it doesn't, then, then it gets lost. Like what happens if the stakes of those stakeholders don't uh, align? And what happens to the ex external aspects? of that business. I mean, you, you are talking about the internal, the structural stuff and, and, and all the things and all the approaches inside a business or a company. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, it looks at least to me that we don't really have the answers what, or I mean, there are several answers to that, that how a business should affect or not affect its region, the families in that region, or any other aspects of, of, of the community in which it operates. Fully agree with that. That's exactly um, where uh, Catholic to uh, social teaching, although it may to many of us sound like old and old school, you know, the Catholic Church with sometimes, unfortunately, it's 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 the bad events that 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 we all are aware of. But Catholic social teaching, as such, as many of us will know, or many of us may not know, is um, okay. Let me say the official teachings. Okay, started about 125, 130 years ago with Rerum Novarum. So uh, tell, tell us a bit more yeah. about Catholic social teaching. Yeah. What is it actually? Yeah, Catholic social teaching, I call it a social theory on, um, on, on, on the, the, the role of, of uh, human beings in, and, uh, in an economy, in a society, and the role of business uh, in a society. Um, and that started off uh, 125 years ago. That was the end of the 19th century when the world, or at least the West, was in, in this uh, full struggle for how to fight against this extremes of, of this extreme classic liberal uh, economy that we were in the middle of. And you saw socialism and communism also emerging from the other side. And the Catholic Church at a certain point had to come with an answer because they neither were 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 in favor of this individualistic kind of an approach, nor were they like, okay, let's have a government that says a one size fits all and will. So, and that where this papal letter in 1891 was published, finally with an answer where it said, uh, where basically it, it, it is around four values that we, most of us may know, may not, human dignity, the common good, solidarity, preferential option for the poor. And, you know, you see sometimes different uh, interpretations and different, but these core values were the basis that were introduced by the Catholic Church. So human dignity is, is, is one of the key, the common good, serving the common goods, solidarity, and, um, and the subsidiarity, by the way, as well. So, um, all kind of complex terms, but the, when it comes to the topic what we're discussing, so in that document, basically the church said, uh, the Pope said, the, the, the purpose of business is not to serve only the interest of the shareholders or the financial owners, but is to serve the common good, is to serve society. There's nothing, the Catholic Church has always been in favor of, of private property as being something very important for the individual to, to, to develop himself, to become himself and to, um, but, um, but in that document at least, it's clear that the, the, the purpose of business is to serve society, to serve the common good, rather than to, so profit is, an, is a means to an end, not an end in itself. And of course, then there was a full extension of how that should all be applied. And importantly for this interview, perhaps interesting as well uh, for our listeners, that in that document, the church actually for the first time allowed uh, employers, uh, employees to unite and to, 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 to establish labor unions. So that be beforehand, the Catholic church was always against this activists uh, and and always has been and also in that document stayed like this but it and then introduced like employees please yes you're allowed to unite because you deserve a decent wage de decent conditions and those kind of things and that yeah. 
in one of your articles you were kind enough to, to share with me, you wrote that uh, when you started researching the links between the successful business model and, and CST, Catholic social teaching, not only your colleagues, but even your, your closest relatives, your wife, uh, seemed to be bored with the idea or they didn't really understand what are, what are you actually doing. Later on, it changed. Uh, so I think now it's time to convince me and the audience that in the secular Europe to pair the words success and Catholic it's works or 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 it can be like a successful model because you know given the secular environment uh, where you know from yoga studios to to <laughs> to Buddhist meditation <laughs> courses we have many many things yeah. and a much more or less Buddhist sanctuaries or or Hindu temples so I I just want to say that these two things like certain traditions or religions are completely separated from certain elements like 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 yoga or, or meditation for for the sake of well-being of of the Western societies or Western people. How could you implement, especially with the label Catholic, such a moral and, and let's be honest, faith-based teachings in, in a Western society or for a Western business? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely challenging. Uh, but I do believe in it because... Um, um, What's in a name? One can say, what's in a name? Okay, yes, let's stick to the term Catholic social teaching. But if, 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 if not, as I said, I consider Catholic social teaching as a social theory, not as a, as a belief that is imposed upon anybody else. So even whether you're a non-Catholic or whatever you like, or an atheist, uh, Catholic social teaching as a theory, and it, and, and it really was developed and it, uh, over the years, so it's, it didn't end with the 1891 kind of a uh, paper <laughs> published it, by... It the, was the beginning, no? It, it right. was the beginning mm -hmm. indeed. So, and it's still dynamic. It's still uh, being uh, further developed. So it's a social theory rather than anything to do with with the religion as such. You, you don't have to pledge, like, I believe in God, if you want to say, like, hey, but I like Catholic social teaching, uh, for example, if you wouldn't like so. Uh, of course you can, but these things can be totally separated. Um, and indeed, what you're saying, may I ask, I mean, yes, it's, it's really unfortunate that we live in a society where we, where spirituality and religion are all among us, Although we sometimes tend to forget that, it's so important. Uh, the, and it will be because if there were no religion, people would invent it <laughs> because we are religious animals. We are animals, I'm sorry to use the word, but religious yeah, beings. Yeah, but this is the original quote. Yes. Yeah. And um, therefore, we would invent it. Uh, and it's, it's really un unfortunate because that we... That that we tend sometimes to easily say, oh, let me go to yoga or do something Buddhist or mindfulness. We've seen the entire mindfulness. Fantastic. If it helps people, there's nothing wrong in it. But uh, what do we actually know about the deeper philosophies behind it? Uh, you know, many of us don't. They just, oh, mindfulness, that sounds, you know, like could help. But that is based on on, on, on Buddhism or that has its ground. That, that's fantastic. But what do people actually know about it? Whereas um, if you look at uh, our Western or European or societies, yeah, whatever we like to contest, but we've been predominantly based on Christian Values and 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 those are all around. Our our economy works based on basically Christian philosophy. Whatever we tend to Buddhism, Buddhism for example, is much more contemplative. Let's say, whereas uh, Christianity is very much an activating uh, kind of a uh, philosophy. Uh, it, it 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 calls upon us to act, whereas Buddhism or Hinduism would be much more contemplative and. Ex and, and that, that, that being an active agent brought us, okay, for the good and for the bad, where many of our societies are now, and in many cases not in that such a bad shape. So, but that we as common consumers may not realize this just is, 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 is a bit of a pity. And Catholic social teaching as such is just a very rich tr intellectual tradition uh, that at least tries to build a coherent kind of a story rather than uh, snippets or, or uh, 
picking pieces that we like. It's, it tries to build a coherent theory about, uh, among other things, um, the role of business in society. What would your ideal company look like where your model is implemented? Let's just take like a general example or a startup, for instance, yeah. because this is very 21st century. Yeah, um, I, I've, I did some work on social entrepreneurship um, because that also became quite, uh, so to speak, a bit hypey, uh, well, I think about 10 years ago or something like this. Like uh, uh, you, start a, you start a business, young people, uh, uh, but also want to do good. So why not to start a business that helps the people in Africa um, and, you know, and, and then to make a profitable kind of a, based on a, on a, on a business model that, that works. Now, fantastic. Uh, yes, all good. But uh, what we also, in one of my studies, saw that is quite difficult to combine those two things in one person to be and you know have the be the social the engaged person who wants to uh, help the world and on the other hand to 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 have a, a business model uh, that you know and especially startups the first thing what we saw in one of the studies but uh, a startup where entrepreneurs are working on is their finance uh, financial part because they need to get the money and the the the, the, the funds to 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 at least during the first years to at least to function yeah <laughs> exactly um, however having said all this i believe that a startup nowadays and also the young people now i would still then refer to this concept of social entrepreneurship not per se in the old style as when I studied it, like doing good in Africa, with, it, but um, from a mindset that, you know, it's fantastic to be entrepreneurial. That's part of, it's a key feature of us being human beings. Uh, however, don't, and, and that's also when I look at my, how I was educated, don't start from the idea like, I want to be rich I, I, and, and then I, you know, will be among the champagne zipping kind of a yacht uh, owners somewhere in the world. So meaningless. I'm sorry to say, I, I allow everybody its freedom, his or her freedom. That's a fantastic feature of our societies as well. However, it's not the thing that I think brings us further uh, and helps us and also doesn't bring the full... Uh, fulfillment to a person because what is nicer as an entrepreneur to feel like hey wow what I'm doing the product or the service that I'm developing really I see it that it that it helps the, our society t to progress to to become better and yes of course that it brings me money is a good thing as well but let me first say like I want to keep on uh, doing the thing in a way that it always contributes to society and that is a mindset thing because I think in many business courses and, and also business schools around the world for years we've been we've been being taught or we've been teaching like you know a business model and you know how does the return on investment come in and I would say like whatever uh, ethical marketing or not we didn't care as long as the money comes in I'm sorry to be so explicit about it and that really has brought us partly to the situation, I think, where our societies and economies and the environment brings us, namely in a very wasteful way of being entrepreneurial. Namely, we didn't care so much because that was not what we were taught. No, if we, from the start, are being taught like, hey, becoming an entrepreneur is a great thing. That's what we need. However, focus on how it really contributes to our societies in the longer term, and if you don't see that contribution of the, your plan, then don't do it. Do something else. And finally, could you share with us a bit more about your time here at MCC in Budapest? We at MCC started uh, a center for diplomacy studies. And um, that's really a great thing because when I got to know about it, I was contacted by one of the, the, actually the head of that center. And when I got to know about it, I was really enthusiastic. I thought, hey, this is a great thing. And I would love to help to, to if I can, and if to, to, to develop it further. Um, I can bring what I did so far, but I also can extend it and expand, uh, et cetera. So um, first I'll be, of course, sharing uh, with students um, on economic diplomacy, commercial diplomacy, business diplomacy. I'll be also doing uh, some teaching on multinationals and corporate social responsibility. Um, and secondly, I would love to uh, 
um, expand my, my, my work on business diplomacy and then particularly focusing on, on, on the issue of corporate governance and Catholic social teaching. So for, and, and, and um, yeah, that's actually what I would love to, in order perhaps the first question that you asked, like, or what we all feel like, how can we make Catholic social teaching uh, work in practice? And that's what I would love to, to, to see as one of the come outs. And that would be great, I think, also for MCC to see that in this way, uh, it can, um, can inspire a young generation uh, in, in, uh, who become, you know, in, in leadership roles after they uh, finish their studies to, 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 to be, at least be inspired by this. They don't have to follow all this exactly, but to be inspired and to be focusing on, yeah, and, and to help uh, to sustain our societies and to make them better really for all of us. Fascinating, Hubero. Thank you very much for joining me here on MCC Podcast. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to this MCC podcast episode. For further media content, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en or look for us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you want to read more by our professors, external contributors, and students, check out our knowledge base at corvinac.hu slash en.